Have you ever looked at jaw-dropping 3D websites and thought, I wish I could build that? Well, today's your lucky day. The 3D web world is vast and full of potential, but let's face it, diving into it can be daunting. Questions like where do I find quality 3D models or how do I integrate 3JS with React might have stopped you in your tracks. Not having a standout portfolio is holding you back from landing your dream job. So let's fix that. Hi there and welcome to one of the best projects we've ever created, where you'll build an entire 3D portfolio inspired by some of the coolest sites out there. Check this out, a floating island in the sky with a plane and even a magical bird. No more endless scrolling, just drag your mouse and navigate using your keyboard to wander around. As you explore the island, you'll encounter interactive elements that serve as your portfolio sections. For instance, reach a water well and a pop-up appears, offering a brief intro and a link for more details. Reach friendly foxes and a new pop-up giving a brief of your work will appear. Then reach the plan section and you'll see the contact info link. If you click on it, you'll be redirected to the contact page. And yes, there's another 3D fox that reacts as you interact with the site. Start typing, it'll start walking. Stop, it will stop as well. Submit the message and it'll start running. Isn't that incredible? Now, you might wonder if this is too advanced for you. Don't sweat it. We'll break down everything from React 3 Fiber for 3D rendering to Tailwind CSS for styling, all in a beginner-friendly way. By the end, you'll become a master for building React UIs upgraded by React 3 Fiber 3D rendering. Alongside this video, I've also prepared a comprehensive 3JS cheat sheet that you can use for reference in all of your future 3JS videos. The link to download the resource entirely for free is in the description. And before we dive right in, a big shout out to Emilian Kasemi, our 3JS developer. If you need expert advice on 3D web projects, his contact is in the description below. So are you ready to build a portfolio that's truly out of this world? Let's get started. Now, you might be wondering, where do I host this incredible portfolio so that everyone can see what I've done? See, the portfolio you'll build today isn't just a project, it's a career asset. It's designed to showcase everything you're capable of, making you an attractive candidate for any job. So before we start coding, we need to set the foundation. I highly recommend Hostinger for hosting your 3D portfolio. They're offering an amazing Black Friday deal right now. And trust me, you don't want to miss this. When it comes to hosting this 3D portfolio, you can go for the premium plan. But in this case, I'll go for the business one. Here's why it's perfect for this project. You get up to five times increased performance, which is essential for smooth rendering of 3D elements. Free SSL for HTTPS security, which builds trust with anyone visiting your portfolio. Free domain name, which gives your portfolio a professional touch. And a free CDN, which ensures that your 3D portfolio loads quickly, further enhancing the user experience. This deal won't last forever. And because we've partnered with Hostinger, you get an even bigger discount. So visit the link in the description, click claim deal, and then add to cart. Here, we need to choose the period of our hosting. And with the crazy discount going on right now, I'll definitely choose 48 months to save the most money. Down below, you can choose your payment method and enter your special JavaScript mastery coupon code which will give you an even bigger discount. Once you've made your purchase, we are ready to set everything up and soon get started with building out our portfolio. So let's start with Hostinger's guided setup. We can skip and create an empty website. Now let's claim a free domain. And if the domain is available, finally click continue, and then you can click finish setup. While our hosting is being set up, I just wanted to quickly let you know that there's a GitHub repository containing the entire code for this project. So if you ever get stuck, just make sure to visit the GitHub page and compare your code with the code that's on here. While you're here, I would appreciate it if you gave this repository a star. Now, another super important thing to mention to make your learning experience as best as possible 
is to join our official JavaScript Mastery Discord server. Thousands of developers are constantly communicating right here. But even more than that, the primary reason to join is that we have created a special 3D portfolio forum so that whenever you experience any problems, this is the best way to get help. With that said, our hosting has been set up, so let's go to the control panel. On top, we can see another Black Friday banner, which reminded me that we're also running a crazy sale on our Next.js 14 course. Next.js 14 just came out, and our course is already up to date. Right now, it is the best course to learn the modern Next.js development. So after you're done watching this portfolio, you definitely want to increase your skills even further by using Next.js to create phenomenal modern web applications. In the course, we also introduced a completely new concept, active lessons. So whenever we have to develop something hard, we motivate you to do it on your own by providing you the task, examples, even the way to think about approaching it, resources, and then even hints on how to approach it. This is the best way to improve your developer mindset. So right now, or after you're done with building the 3D portfolio, go to jsmastery.pro and become a top one Next.js developer. And as you can see, the 3D portfolio domain is ready with the hosting activated. And the only thing it's waiting for is for us to develop the website. So without any further ado, let's get started. We're gonna start from bare beginnings by first creating an empty folder on our desktop called 3D underscore portfolio. Once you have it, open up your code editor of choice. In this case, I'm using Visual Studio Code and simply drag and drop your empty folder in. Once you're there, go to the top left, view, and then terminal. This is going to open up an integrated Visual Studio Code terminal, which is going to allow us to initialize our project. To create our app, you can use any tool, framework, or technology you prefer. That can be Angular, Vue, SwelteKit, Next.js, or just React. In this case, I'll be using Vite that's going to quickly allow us to spin up a React.js application. But in case you want to play with Next.js 14, SvelteKit, or anything else, feel free to initialize the project that way and then follow along with what we're doing. To get started with React, we can just copy this command right here, npm create vite at latest. Go back to your terminal, paste it, press dot slash at the end to install it in the current repository, and press enter. This is going to ask you what framework do you want to proceed with. In this case, I'm going to go with plain React. And just to keep things simple, I'm going to use JavaScript. There we go. In less than a second, our project files have been set up. So let's run npm install. This is going to install all the necessary dependencies to run our project, and then npm run dev to run it. Once it loads in less than a second, you can run it by holding control or command and then pressing this URL. It's going to open it up in your browser, which means that we're good to go. Our base file and folder structure is going to consist of assets, app.css, app.jsx, index.css, and the main.jsx files. There's many files here. But as you know, I want to teach you not just how to do things, but how to approach building everything on your own, which is exactly why we're going to completely delete the entire source folder. Don't worry, we're going to quickly bring it back by creating a new folder called source, which now allows us to start from bare beginnings. First, every app has to have a starting point, which in this case will be a main.jsx file. Here, we can import React DOM from React Router DOM. Then we can say React DOM dot create root. To this root, we need to pass the ID of the element we want to connect to. In this case, it's going to be an element with an ID of root, and then we simply want to render our app. So what this means is that React is going to hook into a single div on our HTML and then populated with all of the great content we're about to create. Of course, we have to have our app somewhere. So let's go into our source and let's create a new app.jsx. There, you can run a command called RAFCE. This is a shortcut. Once you click it, it's going to create a base structure of a React application. If this didn't work for you, you can go to extensions, 
type ES7 plus React Redux React Native Snippets. This is going to allow you to quickly spin up React components and pages. Once you have it, we can go back to our main and you can double click app and then press command or control space and then press enter or click this first link right here, which is going to automatically import the app for you. Before you save this and test it out, there is one change we have to make. React DOM is not coming from React Router DOM. We'll be using this later on. It's coming from react-dom forward slash client. This is what allows us to hook into it. This is built right into React. Now, if you save it and check our website, you can see a text of app appear on the top left. But let's add some styles. To style this application, we'll be using an incredibly popular Tailwind CSS utility-first CSS framework packed with utility classes. That's going to allow you to keep writing your JSX as you usually would with automatically providing all the styles right here. And it's not like any UI kit out there. It doesn't provide you with predefined components. Rather, it allows you to just use some utilities, but then merge them with your own specific design style. It can be simple, playful, elegant, brutalist, and of course, it can be completely custom as well. So let's go ahead and set up Tailwind CSS by going to Docs. And then in quick search, we can type Vite. And it's going to show you how to install Tailwind with Vite. So first we have to install dash D, Tailwind CSS, Post CSS and Auto Prefixer. So let's open up our terminal, open up a new terminal window. And then here you can run npm install dash D for development, Tailwind CSS, Post CSS, and auto prefixer. Once that gets installed, you can also initialize Tailwind CSS by running mpx Tailwind CSS init p. This is going to generate a couple of files such as the post CSS config and Tailwind config. The next step is to configure our template paths within Tailwind config. So let's copy this content and go into our tailwind.config. Here we can replace the content. And this allows us to style all of the files within the source folder, which is exactly what we want. And next, we can copy this h1 hello world to test whether our app works. We can do it right here within the div inside of our app.jsx, indent it properly, and it's looking good. Now, if we do it, you can notice that this indeed is an h1, but it's not underlined, which means that Tailwind CSS properties are not getting recognized. So to make it work, we have to create a new file called index.css, which we have to import within our main.jsx. So we can say import dot slash index.css. And then in the description down below, you can find a link to a GitHub gist. There, you can find our index.css. You can copy all the code and then simply paste it right here. Don't worry, the majority of the styling for this project will still be done completely by you. But here, we simply have some utility classes that are going to help us style faster, such as the class for the input, or blue gradient, or head text. And more importantly, we're importing the Tailwind base, components, and utilities right here. This means that now, if we go here, you should be able to see that the Hello World actually changed. But to make Tailwind fully cooperate with us, we also have to add some additional colors. And the way you do that is with the tailwind.config.js file. So in the same GitHub gist, find that file, copy it, go to tailwind.config.js and paste it right here. This is going to modify the font families as well as add some special colors. So now if we close all the files and simply remain within our app file, you can notice that we should have an H1 that says hello world. And that's exactly what we can see. You can also test out some other properties such as text-red-500. You can immediately notice how my Visual Studio code recognizes this color. And if I hover over it, it even gives me a special color it's going to apply. And if this pop-up didn't show up for you, that must mean that you don't have the right extensions installed. So go to the extensions tab and then search for Tailwind. Here you can find Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. And this is phenomenal because even if you're not used to Tailwind, if you write code, it's going to let you autofill and it's also going to show you exactly which CSS properties are being implemented 
once you hover over the classes. Great. So now that we have gotten that out of the way, the last thing we need to do to get started with coding is reload our terminal by going right here, pressing Control C, and then running npm run dev one more time. This is going to reflect all of the changes that have happened, and we'll be able to see our hello world in the browser. And there we go. We have a big, bold, red, underlined hello world. So finally, let's start turning this into this. To do that, we can first collapse our browser a bit to the side so we can see our code more clearly. And then we can start creating the structure of our grade portfolio. Hopefully, this bird is not going to annoy us here and it's going to let us do our own thing. But it's such a cool feature how it flies in and flies out. So first, we have to implement routing because once you click on about or something else, a new page opens. So we have to have a comprehensive routing system within our React application. And we're going to do that with React's most powerful routing library called React Router DOM. So let's go to our second terminal and let's run npm install react-router-dom. The way it works is it allows us to import a couple of components, such as the route component, the browser router component, which we can rename as router, and a routes component, which is coming from react-router-dom. Once we have that, we can wrap everything in a main section because this is going to be a main part of our application. Once you have it there, we can also give it a class name equal to bg-slate-300 over 20. And this is nothing more than a special background color. If you now save it and go back and reload, you cannot see anything yet. But now let's add a router. A router has to wrap everything. In this case, it has to wrap our navigation bar, which we're going to implement soon. And it also has to wrap all of our routes that we can define like this. And of course, routes component is the parent element for individual route elements. Each route has to be a self-closing component that has a path of forward slash in this case. And once we're in the forward slash, we want to render some kind of a component. And in this case, it can render just a string of home. As you can see, we can see the navbar always. And since we're on the forward slash, we can see home. Now, the next route we're going to need is going to be a route with a path equal to forward slash about. And it's going to render the element that's going to be called about, of course, right? And we have to self close it right here. We can duplicate this two more times. And we can call the second one projects that's going to render the element of projects. And the third one is going to be, of course, contact that's going to render the element of contact. If we now save this, you can see navbar home. And what do you say that we immediately implement this navbar so we can then navigate across all of these different routes? To implement our navbar, we'll have to create a new folder called components. Make sure that it is within the source folder called components. This folder is going to have a new file called navbar. Dot JSX. And there we can run RAFCE, which is going to create a simple navbar component. And we can then go back within the app, turn this into a self closing navbar component, double click it, press control or command space, and just import it automatically. If you do that, you can see the new navbar appear right here, which means that now we can go into the navbar and start creating our first component of the day. Our navbar is going to be an HTML5 semantic header tag. This is important for the SEO so it knows exactly what type of content is within this div. It's going to have a class name equal to header as well. And the first thing we'll show in there is something known as a nav link, which you can automatically import from React Router DOM. This nav link is going to just have a two property meaning once we click it, where is it going to point to? And this one is going to go to the home page, meaning just forward slash. Within it, we can render just a P tag that's going to spell out your initials. I'm going to do a H in this case, it should look something like this. Then we can style it to look more like this. So let's give it a class name equal to 
W-10. This is going to give it a width of 2.5 RAM or 40 pixels. H of 10. Also, this is going to modify the height. We want to make it rounded dash LG. This is going to give it rounded corners. We can also do a background of white. Then we need to center the items within it by saying items center, as well as justify center. And of course, we have to give it a flex container so it nicely centers. We can give it a font bold and a shadow of MD to make it feel like it's floating on top. Now let's style the P tag by giving it a class name equal to blue dash gradient underscore text. If we save this, we have something that is really close to what we have on the final website. Great. So now let's go below this nav link and let's create a nav HTML5 semantic tag. Let's give it a class name equal to flex text dash LG gap of seven between the elements and font dash medium. Finally, we want to create another nav link. This nav link is going to go to forward slash about, and it's going to, of course, say about. React Router DOM really nicely allows us to figure out if this is the current route we're on. In that case, we can apply some different styles. So let's say class name is equal to, let's make this dynamic by having a callback function within. Then we can destructure the is active property and use it to make styles. So we can say if is active is true, then we're going to give it a text dash blue of 500 else we're going to give it a text dash black. Now, if we save this, you can see it's currently black, but if I click it, it's going to be activated. The page is going to change to about, and it's now blue. We can now duplicate this link below, change this to projects, and then also this can be projects. And now we have two nice links and they allow us to switch between about and projects. And if we click home, we have home. This is it for our navigation bar. Now we can go back to our app and we can get started with laying out the main file and folder structure of our application. Each one of these is going to be its own page. So let's go ahead and create a new folder within our source folder called pages. And within it, we can create home.jsx inside of which we can run RAFCE to quickly spin up a React page. We can also repeat this for the about.jsx inside of which we can run RAFCE. Let's also do this for projects.jsx where we can run RAFCE. And finally, let's do it for the contact page.jsx where we can say RAFCE. Now this allows us to close all of these newly created pages. Of course, you can do so manually or you can simply hold control and then press W. Of course, make sure that you're within your Visual Studio code and not Chrome as it would close your window. So I just hold control or command and press W. Now that we have those pages, we can import them and use them within our routes. Let's hold the Alt key on Windows and select all of these line endings here. Use control to move over to the start of each string. Remove the opening string sign and turn it into an opening component sign. Once again, use control to move to the end of the word. One more time, arrow right, and then simply close all of these components. You'll have to do it manually for the other three by providing the ending sign. I just wanted to show you a couple of keystrokes that I usually use when developing to speed up my development workflow. And next, we have to import all of these pages. The simplest way to do that is to go within our pages folder and create a new index.js file. Within this file, we first need to import home from dot slash home, and we can duplicate this three times. Then we can import about from dot slash about projects from dot slash projects and contact from dot slash contact. Finally, we can say export and then mention all of these here, home, about projects and contact. This now allows us to go back to the app and at the top, we can say import and we can use named imports to import all of these pages in one line.
by saying home, about, projects, and contact coming from dot slash pages. Our app is back to the functioning state, and we can still move across all of these routes. And what do you say that we start with the star of our show, the home page? So hold control and move into the home page. And let's go ahead and let's start implementing it together. To get started with our home page, we can first wrap it in an HTML5 semantic section tag because that's what it is, a section. We want to give it a class name equal to a w full, meaning it's going to take 100% of the width, as well as h screen, which is going to make it take 100 view height of the screen. And then we want to make it relative. This is immediately going to make everything look better. Then we can create a div within it that's going to have a class name equal to absolute top dash 28, left dash zero, right dash zero, and a Z index of 10. Now within here, we can say whatever you want, but for now, let's say pop up. You can see it shows up right here. Let's also give it a flex as well as items dash center and justify dash center. And there we go. We have our pop-up. Does this remind you of anything? If you go here, this is the pop-up I'm talking about. We'll be able to focus on that later on. For now, let's simply comment it out and let's focus on creating our 3D screen. Everything starts with a canvas component. That looks like this. For now, let's move this a bit up and let's focus on laying down our 3D screen. This is the first time we're starting to work with 3D elements. So let's install the package we'll use to implement 3D within our React applications. To install it, we can say npm install and the package name is add react-3 forward slash fiber and press enter. React3 fiber is a React renderer for 3.js. It allows you to build your screen with reusable, self-contained components that react to state, are interactive, and can participate in React's ecosystem. So for that, you're going to need types 3 if you're using TypeScript and at react-3 forward slash fiber. It doesn't have any limitations and it's not slower than plain 3.js. This is amazing. Here, you can see the showcase of all of the phenomenal projects that have been built using 3.js Fiber. We have Bruno Simon's phenomenal Fisheye 3.js Journey, Connections, Monitors Even, and a lot of phenomenal projects. Oh, and would you look at that? This is the T-shirt configurator. So if you want to learn even more 3.js, then definitely check out this project after you're done with the portfolio. With that said, as you can see, 3.js and the React 3 Fiber are definitely the way to go when it comes to creating 3D content, and you will learn how to do it in the best way possible. Now that we have installed React 3 Fiber, we can import one of the most components from it. That's going to be Canvas. So import Canvas from add React-3 forward slash Fiber, and we can use it right here within our section by declaring it as a new component canvas. And this is going to act as a root component that sets up our entire 3D scene. So all 3D objects and lights will be rendered within this canvas. And as discussed, it's a part of the React 3 Fiber library, a React renderer for 3.js. We can give it a class name equal to w full for full width, h screen for full height, bg dash transparent and that's it for now we also need to define cameras properties so let's put this in a new line and let's define camera we can provide near and far properties objects closer to the camera than a near property in this case 0.1 won't be rendered same thing for the far so objects that are farther away from 1000 won't be rendered as well so we're just setting up our playing ground Next, we'll be using React's Suspense component, which we can import from React. The Suspense is used as the wrapper. So right here, we can say Suspense and create it as a wrapper. 
and it's used for rendering the loading screen. So we can say a fallback right here is equal to a self-closing loader component. And this is of course a component we have to import from components, loader.jsx, we can run RAFCE, go back and then import it by double clicking and then pressing dot dot slash components loader, which is going to import it at the top. So what this does is while the 3D model is loading, which is going to be quite optimized, but still some loading time will be required. It's going to show the loader instead. So let's go to loader.jsx and let's implement this loader. Here we can create a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex justify dash center and items dash center. Right within it, we want to create a new self-closing div that's going to act as a spinner. So let's give it a class name equal to width of 20, so W20, H of 20, border dash two, border dash opacity dash 20, border dash blue dash 500, border dash T for top dash blue 500, rounded dash full and animate dash spin. This is going to be our loader. We can see it on the finish side. If I reload, it appears really quickly as our model is so efficient. But here's the thing. Whenever you're rendering something within a canvas, it has to be a special 3D property. So to turn this what is not 3D into something 3D, we have to use React 3 Dre. Dre is an addition to React 3 Fiber. And it's a growing collection of useful helpers and fully functional ready-made abstractions for React 3 Fiber. The only thing you have to do is install it, and then you can use all of these helpers. They help you with cameras, controls, gizmos, abstractions, shaders, and so much more. So we can install it by going to our terminal and running npm install add react-3 forward slash dre. Once it gets installed, you can simply import something known as HTML from at react-3 forward slash Dre. And then we need to wrap this entire thing into an HTML tag. That way we're not going to have any issues with the 3D canvas we're in. And now that we have our loader, let's light up our scene so we can see the model that we're going to render soon. There are different kinds of lights in 3D scenes. And without lighting up our scene, we wouldn't be able to see the 3D models clearly. So let's explain all different kinds of lights there are. So this is a mini course in lighting in 3D. First, there is directional light. So we can create a new self-closing directional light component. There's also ambient light. So we can create an ambient light. There is a point light, which we can also create as a self-closing component. There's a spotlight as well, and there's the hemisphere light looking like this. Now, if you just add them, they're not going to do anything on their own. But as soon as we add our 3D island, we're going to go and implement each one of these, and you'll be able to directly see how it impacts the model that it provides the lights for. So let's start with one of the most important aspects of building 3D websites and that is finding quality 3D models. In this case, we're using a website called Sketchfab. It has a lot of completely free 3D models that you can download and use within your applications. And the link down below are gonna be the models that we'll use. As you can see, we'll be using a model called Fox's Island, and it looks great. It even has those little points that we're gonna then display some additional informations on. First, you need to log in or sign up, the link is going to be down in the description. And once you're in, you can click download 3D model and you can download a GLB. Once you download it, you can go to a special website linked below. We'll use this website to help us load GLB models into our 3JS scene. Usually it's a lot of work configuring and animating all of our models meshes, but luckily React 3JS Fiber team created an app that turns GLB files into JSX components. So simply open it up. The link is down in the description and then drag and drop your island here. It's going to load for a second 
and immediately you'll be able to see your island appear right here. It's even going to nicely scroll through it. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that there's a lot of meshes right here. So you can see it has some things on the bottom. It has some additional meshes right here. So it's a bit more complicated than we need it to be. So what we've done is cleaned up this model a bit by removing some of the shadow overcasts as well as some meshes to make it simpler and make it fit our portfolio. So in the description down below, you'll be able to find a modified and cleaned up island.glb file. You can download that one instead of the one you've downloaded before and then drag and drop it here and you'll be able to see the difference. It loads much more quickly, it rotates nicely, and it has fewer lines of code as we clean it up to contain only what is necessary. So this model is going to be down in the description. Feel free to download it, drag and drop it into this website, and then simply copy this entire file by going to exports and then copy to clipboard. Once you do it, we can go right here and then create a new folder called models and create a new file within it called island dot JSX and paste what you copied. Of course, we'll have to turn this into a component. So we can call it const island is equal to a functional component. And then at the bottom, we can just say export default island. Then you're going to notice that it's complaining a bit saying that there's an unknown property called geometry. So let's go all the way to the top. And let's import a couple of things. We'll have to import the use ref as well as the use effect coming from React. We'll have to import use GLTF from React 3 Dre, and we'll have to import use frame as well as use three coming from at React 3 forward slash fiber. Finally, we'll need to import the entire island scene by saying import island scene from dot dot slash assets forward slash 3D forward slash island dot GLB. So do you remember that GLB model that you copied right here into this website? Well, I'm going to also provide it to you in a zipped format with all of the other 3D models we'll be using across this project. So down in the description, you'll find the zipped assets folder. Download it, unzip it, and then paste it right here within the source folder. You'll find a lot of stuff here like all of the GLB models, some icons, images, favicon, and even a song that you can play. Once you have that, you can wrap all of this in an A dot group. So this is a group element. And this A is going to be coming from something completely new. We can import it A from at react dash spring forward slash three. This is a new package we'll have to install to enable animations. Yep, we won't just have static 3D models. We can also say npm install add react-spring3, and that's going to allow us to animate our applications as well. So instead of just simply having the regular group, we can say a.group, which means animated. Then we have all of these meshes inside of it, and we don't necessarily need to cast shadows or receive shadows. So let's select it, press Control or Command F, click this arrow, and then replace all instances with nothing. This is going to remove the cast shadow and we can do the same with receive shadow as well. Finally, we can remove the dispose of null and just say ref is equal to island ref, which we can create right here at the top by saying const island ref is equal to use ref. So we can refer to it later on. So now we have almost everything we need. We can just structure this to look a bit better. There we go. We don't have too many meshes, but all of these meshes together are soon going to display our 3D island. We don't have to use this GLTF preload so we can remove it. And you see all of those warnings that we have, if you hover over it, that's coming from ESLint. It's just a bit confused because it doesn't know 3JS. So what you have to do is hover over it, say quick fix, and then disable react no unknown property for the entire file. Once you do it, it's going to look good and we're going to have our island. Now let's go back to our home. And right here below our lights, let's render a self-closing island component by importing it from the models. 
So we can say at the top, import island from dot dot slash models island and save the file. If we now go back to our current website, you can see that it filed to parse source for the import analysis because the content contains invalid JS syntax. One of the reasons why we're seeing this is because I imported it as a named import, but rather it's going to be a default import. So we have to do this. But the second reason is we have to go into V to config and we have to add assets include, make this an array and say everything, everything forward slash everything, meaning a star dot GLB. So assets are going to include GLB files as well. Once you save it, it's going to load it up, but now we don't see anything. So let's go to our console and let's see what errors do we have. Could not load island.glb. Interesting. Then what else do we have? Also the same thing. So it cannot load island.glb. So let's go to our island. And here we're trying to load the island scene from 3D assets island, which points to the right 3D asset. So this looks good to me, but it's maybe trying to get it from here. And we definitely have to modify this. So we can simply refer to the island scene that we're importing at the top right here. And if you save this, you'll be able to see something that looks like this, which is not exactly what we were hoping for, but that's okay. That's because we have to modify the positioning of our model and modifying 3D elements, positions, rotations, and scaling is super important. That's the main thing when working with 3D objects. So now let's turn this piece of nothing into an island. To do that, we can go back home and then in the home, we can create a new function const adjust island for screen size. Yep, we're not gonna forget this. We want to make our application look good on all different kinds of devices. So we're gonna have a function to see the screen size and then modify the scale and position accordingly. So let's define variables, let screen scale as well as screen position for now just declared. And then we can have an if statement and if window dot inner width is lower than 768, in that case, we can set the screen scale to be equal to an array of 0 0.9, 0 0.9 and 0 0.9. Similar with the screen position, we can set that to be equal to an array equal to zero for the X axis, minus 6.5 for the Y axis, and then minus 43 for the Z axis. So there are three axes when it comes to positioning elements of the screen. And we can have an else statement, copy this, and then modify it right here by saying one, 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 because we're going to be on a larger screen then. So we can have the full size model. And the position is going to be the same, which means that we can simply declare it above. Let screen scale is null. Let screen position is equal to this array right here. And this means we don't have to modify it for each and every one. Finally, we can return an array that contains the screen scale as well as the screen position. And now we can call this function right here on top by saying const island scale and island position is equal to adjust islands for screen size. And now we can use those two variables to pass them into our island as props. So we're going to pass the position equal to island position and the scale equal to island scale. While we're here, we can also define the default rotation. So right here, we can also add the rotation saying let rotation is equal to an array of 0.1. 4.7 and zero. I found these values to work the best. And finally, we can pass that as the third parameter right here to this array. And we can also extract it right from here, rotation. And now we can say rotation is equal to island rotation, which we can call it right here at the top, island rotation. And would you look at that? We can already see our great looking island. This is great. Of course, the lighting is a bit off and we cannot move it around, but this is just the beginning. So what do you say that now we implement the lighting 
to make this all look so much more realistic. Believe it or not, in the 3D world, lighting plays a big role. So let's focus on the directional lighting first. A directional light simulates the light coming from a distant source, like the sun. So let's focus on adding the sunlight to our island. We can do that by saying position is equal to an array of 1, 1, 1, and then we can add an intensity of 2. If we save this, you can see that the lighting has changed. And right now, ESLint is again complaining. So what we might need to do is go into ESLint RC, and then under ignore patterns, we can add source. And this is now going to ignore all the files within the source. So we no longer have those ESLint warnings, and this is looking good. Of course, if you increase the intensity to something like five, you can see it's much brighter. Zero, it's darker. But you can see how it looks really cartoonish right now if it's zero. But if we do two, it gets much more detailed. You can also try moving the sun right here by doing something like 10. And you can see it moves the position of the island. You can also move it on this axis. There we go. So now it's much more central. And you can also change it here as well. So playing with the directional light is really important on how you want your scene to be perceived. So feel free to play with it a bit more. Now let's focus on the ambient light. The ambient light illuminates all objects in the scene equally without casting shadows. So we don't have to declare the position here, but we can add an intensity of about 0.5. And you can see this is just going to make it look a bit better. You can of course do two, which is too bright again. So I think that 0.5 works well. The next slide we have is the point light. A point light emits lights in all directions from a single point. In this case, we won't need it because we're outside. We have the sun and the ambient light, so we can remove it. Next, we have the spotlight. The spotlight is similar to the point light in a sense that it emits light from one direction, but in this case, in shape of a cone. So you can also provide an angle. In this case, we won't be needing it. And finally, there's the hemisphere light. It illuminates the scene with a gradient. So here you can even define something known as a sky color. And in this case, let's go with a color, something like hash B1 E1 FF. Let's give it a ground color as well of something like hash 000, 000, which is black. And let's give it an intensity of one. And now would you look at that? How much more detail can we now see? Check the difference. If I comment it, and if I bring it back, it's looking really, really good. Let's try one more time. If I remove it and reload, and then if I bring it back, there we go. It's looking good. Great. So our island is there and it's nicely lit. Now let's create some sky at the background so it looks even better. It is a flying island after all, right? So the way we're going to add sky is we can create a new component right here within models called sky.jsx and run RAFCE. Then we can go back to home and right here above the island, we can declare the sky self-closing component and we can import it from models sky. That's going to immediately break everything, but no worries because now we can go into the sky and we can turn this div into a mesh, which is going to make everything work. There we go. And this mesh is going to use something known as a primitive element. Our island is not a primitive element. It contains of a lot of different meshes that together create the island. And we need to do it this way as we need to interact with it. Scroll through it, drag and drop, do something at specific elements and so much more. But our sky is going to be primitive. That means that we can simply consume the 3D model that we're going to use. So the way that's going to work is you can say const sky is equal to use GLTF, which you can import from React Tree Dre. And then here you need to pass the sky scene, which you can import sky scene from dot dot slash assets forward slash 3D forward slash sky dot GLB. And you can simply use it within here. Once you do that, you can declare it as an object within a primitive. So we can define a self-closing primitive, 
with an object equal to sky.scene. And if you save it, you can see the sky appear in the background. This is great. Now, please let me know, why didn't we just use a regular image as the background for this island? The reason is, as we're gonna scroll through it, we need to feel like we're inside of a sphere because as you rotate, the clouds need to rotate as well. That's why we use another 3D object. This is it for the sky for now. Later on, we're gonna make it rotate. And we have a couple of other elements here as well. Of course, we need our plane and we need our bird that nicely flies in from time to time. So how do we import those as well? Well, let's go ahead and create two new models right here. We're gonna call it bird.jsx, inside of which we can run RAFCE. And we're going to create a plane .jsx, inside of which we can run RAFCE as well. Now we can simply import the bird right here above the sky. So we can see bird and we need to import it from models. So let's go to the top and say bird coming from models bird. And then we also need to get the plane, which is coming from models plane. Let's also use the plane right here below the island. There we go. And of course it's gonna break because the bird is a div and we need to use a mesh if we're inside of the canvas. So right here, we can define a new mesh as we did before. And we need to do the same thing for the plane. So we can define it as a mesh just so we can see our app again. There we go. So let's start focusing on the bird first. We can do a similar thing we've done before. And that is import the bird scene coming from dot dot slash assets forward slash 3D forward slash bird dot GLB. We can then use it right here by saying const, we can extract the scene as well as animations is equal to use GLTF bird scene. And then we can again use a primitive object right here, but this time it's going to render the scene that is now a bird. And of course we have to import use GLTF from React Tree Dray, save it. And where is the bird? I'm guessing it's hiding somewhere, but we can make it show by adding a position to this mesh. So the position is going to be minus five, two, and then one. And scale is going to be equal to, let's make it small, 0 0.003, 0 0.003, and 0 0.003 one more time. Now, if we move the position a bit to something like five, we still cannot see it. What about 10? No, it's still not there. Now, the reason why we cannot see the bird yet is because it's outside of the screen. If I enlarge it, there we go. See, because it starts from here. And then soon enough, we're gonna animate it to fly closer to the island. Now let's collapse it. This is good for now, but as I said, soon enough, we're gonna animate it as well. And let's do a similar thing for the plane. So in the plane, we can again import the plane scene coming from dot dot slash assets forward slash 3D forward slash plane dot GLB. We can extract the scene by saying const scene and animations is equal to use GLTF, which we can import and then we can pass the plane scene. And then we can declare it as a primitive within a mesh. Right here, primitive, object, scene. And there we go. You can see that it's looking at us right now. It's flying towards us. But the beauty of 3D models is that you can turn them around and position them however you want to. So later on, it's going to look like this and we'll be able to move it across the screen. So now that we have all of the most important models within our most important page, which is the home page, we can slowly start making them more interactive. So far, we have just lit them up, created the island and put all the elements here. But the goal is to make them all look great together and to be able to move across the actual island to get some things on top. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's start by implementing the dragging rotation. That's one of the primary features. And for that, I do have to give props to Joshua for creating Joshua's world. This application has been an inspiration for 3D developers for decades. 
and he has implemented this way of moving through the 3D circular island. But here's the key part. Everybody has been looking at this portfolio and admiring it, but so far, nobody has created a tutorial, which is exactly what I wanted to do with this 3D world. So let's go ahead and focus on the rotation next. First, we can create a new use state at the top. Use state, use state snippet. We can call it is rotating and set is rotating at the start set to false. And of course, we have to import use state from React, which we can do right here. Now, the only thing we're going to use this for is to get to this drag and drop feature. So once you click it, it's going to turn into an actual draggable mouse, not just a typical cursor. And you can even click on it, and it's going to look like you're holding it. So that's the whole point. So now we can do that by using the use effect. Now, how can we do that? Well, really simply. In our canvas, we can turn this class to dynamic class, like so. And then at the end, we can say if is rotating, in that case, cursor dash grabbing, else we're going to have a cursor dash grab, meaning we can grab it for the first time. So if we save this, you can now see a cursor grabbing. And of course, we'll have to pass this over to our island so we know when we're doing something. So alongside these three, we can pass is rotating set to is rotating, set is rotating to set is rotating. And that's it for now. But now this plane is really bothering me. It looks like it's going to jump at me. So let's go ahead and modify its position as well. We can do that by creating another function just like this one. Adjust islands for screen size. We can duplicate that right here below and rename it to adjust plane for screen size. Here, we don't have to deal with the rotation yet. So we're just going to have screen scale and screen position. Here, both values are going to be set to undefined at the start. So we can simply declare them like this. For smaller screens, screen scale is going to be 1.5 all across the board. So we can do it like this. And screen position is going to be equal to 0, minus 1.5, and 0. On larger screens, we can have 333, 3, 3, which is a bit of a larger size. And then screen position can be set to minus 4 and minus 4. Those values make it look better on larger screens. Now, we can also call this similar to as you would call a hook by saying const plane scale plane position is equal to adjust plane for screen size. And we can just collapse those two so we don't have to look at them and we have a bit of a cleaner working environment. There we go. And now we can simply pass those two as props to our plane. The way you would do that is similar. We have our island, and then we pass the plane scale equal to plane scale, and also plane position equal to plane position. We can also pass is rotating right here, because if we are rotating, we wanna move the propeller. And the rotation can be fixed, so we can see rotation is 0, 20, 0. Now, this is going to break it because in our adjust plane, I have a typo screen position right here. And then we don't need to return rotation in this case. And I also have to correct our screen position here at the end. And there we go. We can see our plane. Now, why didn't they change the position and rotation and all those things yet? Well, that's because we're simply passing these as props but we are yet to accept them within the plane model right here. So the way we can do that is we can accept all of the props, for example, is rotating, as well as all the other props, which we can simply spread right here. Now, why would we spread the props? That's because we can simply pass them into our mesh. So right here, dot, 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 props. And now you can see our plane is looking good. Of course, we'll have to modify it a bit later on to look like this. But for now, it's much better than before. It's not coming towards us. So now let's go back to the home. And let's get back to what we were working on, which is allowing the rotation of the island. To do that, we can now go into the island and do the same thing. We can accept all of those props by saying is rotating. Set is rotating and then dot, dot, dot props to spread them right here. 
Once you do that, we have to get access to the 3JS renderer and the viewport. And the way we do that is by saying const gl as well as the viewport is equal to use three, like so. It's a hook. Then we have to use a ref to get the last mouse position. So let's say const last x, meaning horizontal position, is equal to use ref zero. We can do the same for the rotation speed by saying const rotation speed is equal to use ref zero. And then we can use something known as a damping factor, const damping factor, which is going to be set to 0 0.95. This is going to play an important role of kind of when you scroll it, how fast does it move and how does it continue moving afterwards, which is pretty cool. Now there will have to be three different functions. The first one is what happens once you press the mouse down, right? So now we're, so here we're not just clicking, we have to click it, hold it when it flies, and then we release it. So there has to be a function for each one of these little actions. We can say const handle pointer down is equal to where we get an event. And first things first, we want to stop the event propagation. So e dot stop propagation. This means that the mouse click is only going to do what it does in this function, and it won't touch any other elements or functions on the screen. We can also do e dot prevent default. So we won't simply reload the page or do anything like that. And finally, we want to turn on the set is rotating because we have started to hold it. Similarly, we want to repeat this function duplicated two more times. So one, two. The second time we're going to say handle pointer up. So this is once we have actually released the mouse and then we want to set rotating to false. And the last one is handle pointer move. So when we simply move it and there we don't want to touch is rotating. So now each one of these functions will also have to have some additional logic. Once we press the pointer down, we need to figure out if it's a touch event on a phone or a mouse event const client x is equal to event dot touches. If it is an event that touches, then we want to get the event dot touches zero dot client x. Else we want to get event dot client x. So once again, it depends on what kind of a click it is. And of course, it's going to be just e because we have named it e as an event right here at the top. Finally, we want to store the last position of the X right here. Last X dot current is client X. And we can collapse our handle pointer down. Now on up, we want to do something similar. So let's go ahead and copy this client X and paste it in the handle pointer up. But then we want to calculate the change in the horizontal position by saying cons delta, often known as a change, that's going to be equal to client x minus last x dot current divided by the viewport dot width. So yes, we do have to do just a bit of math, but this is more or less it. Finally, we also want to update the islands rotation based on the mouse. So we can say island ref dot current dot rotation dot y, meaning top and bottom, plus equal to delta, which is the difference, times a specific factor, for example, 0 0.01, times math.pi, because we're working with a circle here. Finally, we want to update the reference for the last client x position by saying class x dot current is equal to client x. And then we want to update the rotation speed by saying rotation speed dot current is equal to this difference times 0 0.01 times math.pi. So all of this fits in a couple of lines. I know it might be a bit different and we are using some math here, but hopefully it's all going to make sense soon. And now we can close the handle pointer up. And the handle pointer move only wants to happen if we are rotating. So if it is rotating, then we can simply call handle pointer up. So it's doing the same thing as the handle pointer up like this, with passing the event right into it. We can also do it in one line like so. 
more on that soon. But now it's time to put all of these functions to good use. So let's create a new use effect. This use effect has a callback function and it's going to happen whenever one of the variables in the dependency array changes. In this case, we can put a lot of things here. When GL changes, when the handle pointer down changes, which shouldn't really change because it's a function declaration, but it's good to list them here, pointer up and handle pointer move as well. So essentially it's not going to change a lot. We need to do this only at the start. So what do we wanna do? We want to add event listeners for all pointers by saying document that add event listener pointer up, handle pointer up, pointer down, handle pointer down, pointer move, same thing, you wanna call it. You can see the GitHub Copilot did it for me here because it's really repetitive. I'm using this great GitHub Copilot extension that simply autofills all of your code. So whenever you see some crazy suggestions in real time, that's Copilot doing the coding for me. It is paid, I'm not getting sponsored for saying this, but I highly recommend you to try it out. I do think they have a free month trial. Anyway, you can type this out, just do the first one and then copy a couple more. So this is adding events and also removing them from the canvas once we exit the page. And still, this is not going to allow us to move, more on that later. But while we're here, let's also add the ability to move with the keyboard. To do that, we can say const handle key down is equal to an event, where if e.key is equal to arrow left, and if we're not rotating, so if not is rotating, we wanna set is rotating to true, and we wanna change the island ref dot current dot rotation dot y plus equal to 0 0.01 times math dot pi since it is a circle. So that's going to look like this. Else, if the arrow is right, we want to do the same thing but reverse. So else if e dot key is equal to arrow right, if it's not rotating, set rotating to true, and then move it by minus equal to minus one. And finally, what happens if we handle a key up? So we can say const handle key up. Well, if e dot key arrow left or e dot key arrow right is keyed up, in that case, we simply want to stop rotating. So we can set it to false. And we also need to add event listeners for these properties as well. So document that add event listener key down as well as key up. And we want to remove them right here at the end. Now we can collapse this use effect and all of the functions we have created and put them to good use. The way we're going to put all of this to action is going to be using a special, you can call it a hook called use frame. This use frame is going to accept a callback function that's going to happen on every single frame. And this hook is coming from React 3 Fiber directly. Now this function is gonna apply on every single frame. So here we can check if it's not rotating. So if not is rotating, then we can apply the damping factor, which means that it's going to make the plane roll smoother. So we can say rotation speed dot current times equal to damping factor. So it's going to get slower and slower until it slows down. Then we want to completely stop the rotation if the speed is low. So we can say if math dot absolute rotation speed dot current is lower than or equal to 0 0.001, then we want to simply set it to zero. Now below this outside if, not this inner one, but outside, if we are rotating, which we can add an else here, then we have to get the current rotation. So const rotation is equal to island ref dot current dot rotation dot y. And now I want to be completely honest with you. I have a block of code that you'll be able to copy from the GitHub just down below. So let's copy and paste it here together. It contains a very long comment saying a lot of things right here. It says that we have to normalize the rotation value to ensure it stays within the same range from zero to two times math.py. 
The goal of this is to ensure that the rotation value remains within a specific range to prevent potential issues with very, with very large or negative rotation values. And then here's a step-by-step -step explanation and the way that the math is mathing. Uh, this was done for me by ChatGPT. I am in no way a math or 3JS expert, so this was really helpful to ensure that the application behaves smoothly. And then here, we're also setting current stages. And that's something that's going to allow us to be at different stages. For example, we start at stage zero, and then we show this line right here. Once we move to stage one, we show a different one. So that's the only thing it is. But yeah, in general, this was only to normalize the way we drag and drop our plane. One thing that I've missed right here in this use effect is to add a const canvas is equal to gl.dom element. What I've done here is I've only attached these elements to the regular DOM, but we have to attach them to a canvas instead, because once we click here, we're not touching the regular DOM, we're touching the canvas. Remember, we're wrapping everything inside of a canvas. So we have to define the canvas. And then for these first three, we have to say canvas that add element, and then canvas that remove element, because we're not touching the screen, we're touching the canvas. But still, if you try to scroll, it's not going to do its work. So we have to look into the handle pointer up. And I think I've made a mistake here. The only thing that the handle pointer up has to do is stop the rotation, nothing else. So that's it. This has to happen within the handle move. So we can copy all of this, delete it from here, and then move it to the handle pointer move instead of this handle pointer up. So we can say if is rotating, and then we can paste all of these other things. And since it's still not working, we can go ahead and go inspect and go to the console, reload the page, and you can see e.stopProgation is not a function. Here, it's supposed to say propagation. Oh my God, there we go. We got it, and we have to fix it in all three places. Propagation, there we go. And now if you reload, you can see that it actually moves around. So we can move it around with our mouse, as well as with the key presses. I know, I know, it doesn't look like it does on the final website, but don't worry, we're gonna get there. One thing we have to do is also collapse all of these functions for easier view. And then we can go into our use frame. And here we can use this rotation speed to slow it down. The way to do that is say island ref dot current dot rotation dot y plus equal to rotation speed dot current. So this is going to apply that slowing down of the plane as we scroll. So now if I move it, you can see how much more smooth it is. There we go. That's much, much better. We can also expand it to admire it in its full glory. There we go. This is looking good. But of course, our plane is looking a bit plain. Uh, what we can do is we can activate it. So for now, we're done with the island. Let's go to our home and let's move into our plane. Working with our plane is going to be much simpler since it's a primitive. So what we have to do is load up the scene and animations. We also have to load up something known as actions, which is equal to use animations coming from React Tree Dre, to which we have to pass the animations and then a ref to the original mesh. So here we can say const ref is equal to, we can import use ref from React. And now we can attach it right here by saying ref is equal to ref. Now we have access to these actions and based off of the actions, we can play a model. Some models come with some pre-playing actions such as the rotating blade here for this plane. So let's use a use effect. Right here, we can create a callback function and as a dependency array, we can say actions and is rotating. We're passing that through props. Then if it is rotating, we can do something like actions, take 001 dot play. And else we can do something like actions, take 001 dot stop. So this is going to turn on our plane and turn it off. 
As you can see currently, we have an error, but we can fix it by going to inspect, console, and we can see what's happening. In saying that use effect is not defined, that's a simple fix. We can simply import it right here from React by saying use effect. And now if you drag and drop, well, it's not spinning yet. So let's figure out why that is the case. We're calling these actions, take 001 and calling the dot play on it. Actions is directly taking the animations from our original plane scene and a reference to the model. And then the plane is coming from assets, 3D plane GLB. So everything is looking good here, but maybe is rotating is not working. So let's see if we're properly passing it. Is rotating is rotating. So what we can do is simply console log the is rotating. And then see if we're getting true and false as we turn it on and off. So we can go right here to the console and we can see set current stage is not defined. So this is breaking within our, I believe, island. That's going to be for these pop-ups that appear. We need to know on which one are we on. So that's a simple fix. Right at the top, we can declare a new use state and say current stage and set current stage at the start equal to one. Then we can pass that over to the island, set current stage, and that can be equal to set current stage. So now as we move through it, these errors should no longer occur. And as we move the plane, oh, set current stage is still not defined. That's because we are passing it, but we have to accept it right here by saying set current stage coming from props. If we now reload, hopefully we won't have any more errors. And as you scroll, it really looks like it's flying through the air. This is amazing. Now to make this even more realistic, what we can do is also rotate the sky. So we can say in the sky, if is rotating is equal to is rotating, we can move into the sky and accept this prop right here is rotating. We can define a ref by importing use ref from react as well as use frame. Remember that function? It allows us to do something on each and every frame. And that is coming from react three fiber. Now let's define the sky ref is equal to use ref. We can attach it to this mesh by saying const ref by saying ref is equal to sky ref. And now we can use the use frame function, give it a callback function and say, if is rotating, then we can say sky ref dot current dot rotation dot y plus equal to 0 0.25 times the delta. And the delta comes directly as the second argument to our use frame function or the parameter. So we can just get it from here. Now, if we rotate, you can see the sky is moving as well. You can make it move slower or faster by modifying this factor right here. This is way too fast. If we do something like 0 0.15, this is going to look good. And now you can see we're flying through the air as the sky and the cloud moves, as well as the island and the plane. How cool is this? So now we're done with all of the major parts of our homepage. But of course, we don't have this beautiful bird flying in. So what do you say that we do the bird next? Let's hop into the bird. And this is going to be a real test for you to see if you've learned something about 3JS. We're going to use similar things we've used so far. We're going to import use ref from react as well as use effect. We can immediately declare that ref by saying const bird ref is equal to use ref. And we can add it to our mesh by saying ref is equal to bird ref. We can put this in multiple lines so it's easier to see. Now we're going to start the animation by turning on this use effect. So whenever it just opens, that means on an empty dependency array, we simply want to trigger a specific action. And to get to the actions for a specific 3D model, you need to do the following. You need to get its animations from useGLTF 
by passing a specific scene and then say const actions is equal to use animations, which is coming from React Tree Dre, and you have to pass the animations and the ref to the model that you want to animate. It all works so nicely together. Then you can say actions, take 001.play, and this is going to automatically play the bird animation. We might need to increase the screen size a bit so we can see it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's standing at its place right now and swinging its wings. So what we need to do is we need to make it move around, right? That's the key part right here. So how do we make it move around? Well, once again, we can use the use frame function, which accepts the delta as the second parameter. And here we can update the position of the bird to simulate the flight. Now, of course, we can do something simple like bird ref dot rotation dot y plus equal to 0 0.15 times the delta, meaning the difference. And of course, import the use frame from React 3 Dre. You'll be able to see that the bird kind of stays here, right? Doesn't really move that much. What if we change the x right here? Yeah, it's moving a bit, I think it around itself. But what I'm trying to say is we cannot really do a simple movement right here. We have to do something more complicated. We have to make it move like a bird, which is not easy. So I spoke with ChatGPT just a bit and came up with a function that's going to update the Y position to simulate the flight moving in a sinus wave. Yep, that's right. Once again, we have a bit of math. A sinus wave moves like this. So it's a wave. It's moving predictably, but it changes. It's not just a linear line. So to implement that sinus wave, you can do something like this. Bird ref dot current dot position dot y is equal to math dot sin and you wanna move it by a specific expression. It can be a number, but also we can extract something from the use frame. It gives us access to the clock as well as the camera. And we can play with those two properties by passing the clock dot elapsed time. And this is going to keep track of the total time the clock has been running. So it's going to move as the time moves, it's going to change the value. So we can say elapsed time. And we can add any number to make it look better, like 0 0.2 plus 2. So now if we save it, you can see it's still standing in its place. That's because we have to change the X position as well. So to move it around, we can check if bird ref dot current dot rotation dot Y is triple equal to zero. In that case, we want to move forward by saying bird ref dot current dot rotation, we want to modify the x axis by saying plus equal to 0 0.01. And then we want to do the same thing for the z or z axis. But we want to move it to minus direction. If we do this, it slowly starts to fly around itself. We can do similar thing to make it move backwards right here by simply copying those two and then replacing them. The first one is minus equal to, and the second one is plus equal to. But the most important thing is to change the x direction. So it actually moves across the island. So to do that, we can say if bird ref dot current dot position dot x is greater than camera dot position dot x plus 10, meaning if it has exited our camera, then we want to change the direction to go backwards and rotate the bird 180 degrees. So bird ref dot current dot rotation dot y is equal to math dot pi. So we simply rotate the bird. Else, if, if it hasn't reached the end, we can say bird ref dot current dot position dot x is lower than camera dot position dot x minus 10. It means it's still in the screen and we want to move it forward by saying bird ref dot current dot rotation dot y is equal to zero. If we save this and reload, 
you can see it still moves around. Something is wrong. It's just flying over right here. It went away and then it's rotating one more time. What if I increase the width? Yep, it looks like it's just doing some crazy stuff right here. Who would have said that you're going to do some math with a bird? Not you, right? The reason why it's being around is because here, to move it forward, we don't need to modify the rotation, but rather the position. So four times here, we need to say position.x plus equal to one and so on. So if we modify this, you'll be able to see that the bird is actually going to fly right in and it's going to get smaller as it moves into the screen. How cool is this? And if you rotate, you can see that you can follow the bird or go away from it. This is pretty cool. It gets smaller and as it approaches the end of the screen, it's going to rotate and come back. Now I know we've done a lot of stuff, so let's repeat what does this use frame do with adding some special comments. I'm going to paste this code right here and check this out. I'm gonna increase the code. So let's go through it one more time. Again, doing math with the bird. So first we want to update the Y position to simulate bird-like motion using a sine wave. We just increase this math sinus as the time goes and we multiply it by some values. Then we have to check if the bird has reached a certain endpoint relative to the camera. If so, we change direction backwards and rotate the bird 180 degrees. Else, we just keep it going forward. And finally, to move it forward or backwards, we can use these positioning values. The entire code of this project, including this bird file, is going to be in the GitHub directory. So feel free to refer to it. If you're stuck, if the bird is not moving like it should for you, you can definitely just copy the bird JSX file and paste it over here. So our plane is flying, our bird is flying in as well. The last thing we have to do is implement these phenomenal pop-ups that are going to show up once we reach a specific point of our portfolio and then allow us to open up some more pages. So let's do that next by closing the bird. And then in our home, we can bring back this pop-up that we have created before. Let's copy it and then paste it right here above our canvas. We can uncomment it, save it, and you can see pop-up. As we move, it's always there, but somehow we'll have to make it show only if it should be showing. So to do that, let's create a new component inside of our components folder called home info .jsx and run RAFCE inside of it. Then we can use it right here by opening a new dynamic block of code and check if current stage exists. Then render the home info component as a self-closing component like this. You have to import it and we need to pass the current stage into it as a prop. So current stage is equal to current stage. Now, if we save it, it's showing at the start, it's saying home info. And as we move, it appears only once you reach a specific milestone, such as this water well right here, these foxes, these carrots, and so much more. So now let's move into the home info and let's start implementing it. To start implementing our home info, we're going to make it as reusable as it can be. And in the process of doing so, I'm going to show you a couple of cool React tips and tricks. First, we can return our home info. And home info is going to return just one thing. And that one thing is going to be a new object called render content, which is an object that has a couple of things. It has one, which is going to be content one. That's going to look like this, just a simple H1 that's going to say something like one for now. And then we can duplicate this three more times, two, three, four, and modify the content to say two, three, and then four as well. So now we have four different contents that we can render. A cool thing about this is that now we can render this render content. And as props, we're getting the current stage. So what we can say is say render content 
and then access the current stage number or else return null. So what this means is if we save this now, and if we scroll through it, you can see that it says one right now. But as we go to the second stage, you can see that it says two right here. That's because it's rendering the second stage and then showing the second content. So this is a really cool thing to make it reusable. It says three, four, and then again, one. So now let's create an info box that's going to show up once we reach a specific section. Const info box is equal to, it's going to be an arrow function, of course, an arrow function with an instant return. So you don't have to put curly braces and say return. You can just immediately return something. The info box is going to accept a text, link, and a BTN text. Essentially, only the things that are changing from a pop-up to a pop-up. As you can see, the color, the background, all of that is the same, but it's the text and the button text that is changing. So to implement it, we can also just render the text right here for now. And specifically in the first step, we won't be using this info box because the first step is a bit different. But what we can do is give it a class name equal to on small devices, text dash XL on small devices, also leading dash snug. This is going to change the line height, text dash center, neo brutalism dash blue padding Y of four, padding X of eight, text dash white, and margin X of five. This is going to create this nice square. And right within it, we can say, hi, I am, and then we can create a new span element inside of which we can say Adrian, or you can put your own name. That can have a class name equal to font dash semi bold. And after the span, you can simply go to Google search for waving hand emoji and just paste it after this pan. Then you can add a break tag. And after it, you can say a software engineer from Croatia. Of course, feel free to put your own country right there. And now I can unzoom it. So it all looks great. Now for the second, third and the fourth one, we'll be using this info box. So let's copy it and let's put it above the render content as we'll be referencing it within it. Within our info box, we are rendering text. And then below the text, we're gonna render a link component, which has to be imported from React Router DOM. It has to have a two property, which in this case is going to be link, and it has to have a BTN text property. And now we can refer to this info box right here as a self-closing component. Let's scroll to it. And there we go. You can see an empty box. Let's give it a text property equal to, let's do something like worked with many companies and picked up many skills along the way. Okay. That sounds good to me. There we go. Let's also give it a link equal to forward slash about. And let's give it a BTN text equal to learn more. Okay, now we can finalize the styles for our info box by turning this text into a P tag. That's going to have a class name equal to font dash medium on small devices, text dash Excel and text dash center. The link is going to have a class name equal to Neo brutalism, which is the style we're using dash white and Neo dash BTN. And then the button can also have an image that has a source equal to arrow, which we have to import at the top. So we can say import arrow coming from dot dot slash assets forward slash icons. There we go. That looks a bit better. And let's also give it a class name equal to w-4, h-4, and object contain. There we go. Now I think you'll be able to see the purpose of reusing this box because now we can simply copy this, duplicate it two more times right here, 
indented properly, and now we can just change the text. So for the third one, we can say something like, led multiple projects to success over the years. Curious about the impact? The link is going to go to projects, and we can say something like, visit my portfolio. For the final one, we can say something like, need a project done or looking for a dev? I'm just a few keystrokes away. That can go to contact, and it can say something like, let's talk. Now, as you scroll through the website, you can see this first one is learn more. The second one is this, visit my portfolio. And then the third one is let's talk. And then you get back to the first one. So all of this now makes a lot of sense, looks amazing, and we have used the best reusable code practices in React. Definitely mark this down somewhere, save it, so you know when you have some reusable content, how you can reuse it. With that said, we're now done with the home info. And with that, we're done almost with the entire home. Later on, we're gonna add some audio, but now is the time that we go ahead and focus on some other pages that we have here. We have a phenomenal about section. We have a project section, but I wanna do something else first. I want us to focus on none other than the contact section. Once you click Let's Talk, it redirects you to this phenomenal contact section with email JS integration, but more importantly, with this crazy fox that as you start typing, it actually moves. And then as you send an email, it starts running. So this is a lot of 3D manipulation we'll be doing, and I'm sure you wanna do that first and then focus on the other two pages. So let's do exactly that. We can go to our app component, and then simply move to the contact page on which we can start working. We've done a lot of 3D stuff for now. So to get started with the contact section, let's first focus on these general JSX elements, and then we can move to this crazy fox. So let's start by wrapping everything in a section. And that section is going to have a class name equal to relative flex. On large devices, flex row usually flex call, as you can see it is right now, and a max container. Let's see how does it look like. If we go to, let's stock, and now you can see we have nothing in there. Now, we wanna show a new div right here below, and within it, we wanna have an H1 that's going to say get in touch. There we go. The div is going to have a class name equal to flex-1, min dash w dash 50% and flex as well as flex dash call. The H1 is going to have a class name of head dash text. Immediately within the H1, we're gonna have a form. The form is going to have a class name equal to w dash full flex, flex dash call, gap of seven between the elements and a margin top of 14. Within it, we can create a label for our first input. So a label that's going to say name. It's going to have a class name equal to text-black-500 and font-semi-bold. Right below the name, we can create our first input. This input is going to have a type equal to text, name equal to name, class name equal to input. If we save it, you see a real input right there, a placeholder equal to John. It's going to be a required field. It has to have a value. So let's go ahead and define the value by creating a new use state field. Right at the top, we can say use state is equal to use state snippet. Let's call it a form and set form. At the start, that form can be an empty object that has a name equal to an empty string, email equal to an empty string as well, and a message equal to an empty string. We of course have to import use state from React. Right below this form, we can also define a handle change, which for now we can leave as an empty callback function. Now in the value, we can say form.name 
and on change, we can call the handle change function. Also, you can see that the fox is now steady, but as soon as I focus on the input, it starts walking. So we'll somehow have to track the state of whether we're clicking on the input or not. And to do that, we can create two new functions, const handle focus is equal to a function, as well as handle blur. The focus is called once you click on it, and the blur is called once you click out. So we can add those two functions to our input by saying on focus equal to handle focus and on blur handle blur. We can now duplicate this label two more times, one, two, and the input within it. The second time the type is going to be email, the name is going to be email, and the label is going to say email. The placeholder is going to be john at gmail.com just imagine having that email address. And it's going to say form.email. Finally, the last one is going to be your message. It's going to have a name equal to message. It won't have a type. And it's going to be a text area, not an input. It's going to have a placeholder here. Let me know how I can help you. It will be required it will have rows equal to four and a class name of text area. And the value will be form.message. There we go. Finally, we want to show a button right here below the last label. And this button is going to have a type is equal to submit. It's going to have a class name equal to BTN. On focus, it's going to call the handle focus. And on blur, it's going to call the handle blur. Now, sometimes while we're sending the request, we need to have some kind of a loading state. So let's create a new state called is loading. Use state snippet is loading, set is loading at the start set to false. So now we can add a disabled property. And if is loading is true, then the button should be disabled. Else, we can look into the button and say if is loading, in that case, say sending dot dot dot, else say something like send message. There we go. Our button is done as well. Now, before we start focusing on this great fox, let's actually enable our email JS service so you can receive emails from your clients. To do that, we have to add a couple of properties to our form, such as on submit, we need to call a special handle submit function. So this is the last function we're going to create. Const handle submit is equal to another function. And we also want to attach a ref to it. So we can define a new reference at the top. Const form ref is equal to use ref at the start set to null. And we of course have to import use ref from react. So now we can slowly start implementing our form. Specifically, we have to implement the handle change. The way the handle change works for all of these inputs is it's taking the key press event. And then based off of that event, it calls the set form function, where it first spreads out all of the other properties. And then within square brackets selects a specific field to update e .target name, and updates it to e .target value. So now this is going to update all of the properties from our form. And now we can focus on the handle submit. The handle submit gets the final event, the key press event. And we have to call e.prevent default to not reload our page after we submit it. We want to initiate the loading process by saying set is loading to true. And then we want to use email JS. So let's go ahead and install the email JS package. It's one of the simplest packages I know for enabling email communication. So let's say npm install add email JS forward slash browser, install it, and then you'll be able to import it at the top by saying import email JS from add email JS forward slash browser. Within our handle submit, we can now call that email JS dot send. Specifically, we want to send an email 
but we have to have a couple of things. We have to have the service ID, the template ID, and then the public key. So where are we going to get these from? Well, we of course had to head to email.js. So just Google email.js, go to it, and then create a free account or log in. Once you're in, you should be able to see a screen that looks like this. You have 200 emails remaining, which would be more than enough. Imagine getting emails about 200 job opportunities. What would you do all day? Let's go ahead and click add new service and let's add Gmail. Then you have to copy the service ID and for now paste it right here in the code and click connect account. And then once you give it access, you'll be able to see connected. Finally, you can click create service. You're gonna get a new email saying that everything works. Then you have to create an email template. Click create new email template. And I'm fine with this basic email template saying hello to name. You got a new message from from name and then the message right here. So let's click save. So let's go to settings and let's copy the template ID. And we can paste it right here as the second parameter. Now we can go back to our app and we're not going to store these keys right here. You never want to store any kind of keys within your application. You need to create them within a .env file. That stands for environment variables, specifically .env.local. You can paste them here and give them a name. The first one is going to be vite underscore app, and it has to begin like that, underscore email.js, underscore service, underscore ID, and you can just put an equal sign there. We can do the similar thing for the template ID, vite underscore app, underscore email.js, underscore template, underscore ID is equal to template ID. And then you'll also need a public key. So you'll have to go back to your account one more time right here and then copy this public key. You can say vite underscore app, underscore email JS, underscore public, underscore key, and simply paste the key right here. Now, if you go back, you can finally close email JS. And now we can pass all of these as specific environment variables. The first one is the service ID. So we can say import dot meta dot env dot vite underscore app underscore email js underscore service ID. The second one is going to be the same thing, but the template ID. The third thing is going to be the object containing all the things you have to pass, such as the from name equal to form dot name. Then we're going to have a to name equal to your name right here. I'm going to put Adrian. Then we're going to have a from email, which you want to get from the form by saying form dot email. Then we're going to have a to email, which is going to be your email. So you can put your contact, whatever email it is. And then you want to put the message equal to form dot message. Finally, the last parameter to the send form is going to be the public key. So you can say import meta env v underscore app underscore email js underscore public underscore key. There we go. So now we're sending everything we need to do in our form. And this is an asynchronous operation. So we need to call a dot then on it. So what happens then? So then we set the loading to be false because we're done. And we can also show an alert. So here I'm going to add a to do for later to show success message, and then also a to do to hide an alert. Finally, after the dot, then we can put a dot catch that gets the error. Also sets the loading to false. Kanza logs the error so we can see what's happening and also shows the alert. So for now I can say show error message. Great. So what do you say that we go ahead and test it out? I'm going to collapse this right here and enter my name, enter my second email and enter my message of does this work? By the way, the Fox is great. Let's go ahead and click send. Sending. Okay. That's good. And it does appear to be stuck at sending. So let's go to inspect. 
Let's go to console. And it seems like the third parameter is expected to be the HTML form element. So it's complaining about that third parameter within our email. Oh, that's because I used send form. It was just supposed to be sent. My bad right here. Let's just copy this message, reload, and just try it one more time. And click send. Sending and immediately the loading went away. So one thing we need to do here, of course, is also clear the form. So we have to say set form and then clear it to default values. But if you click it again, it still doesn't clean it, which means that we must be in the dot then and not the dot catch. So let's go to our inspect, open up the console, and it looks like we get an email JS response status, the service ID is invalid. I'm thinking that it's not invalid, but we might need to reload our application for environment variables to take effect, and then it will be able to read them. So maybe that's it. So let's reload the app by pressing Control C and then Y, rerun it, and let's give it one final go. Send message. Still nothing, no. Let's see what do we get now. In the console, it's still the same error. The service ID is not there. Let's see if we have spelled it correctly by going to env local and just checking it out. Vite app service ID, that is good. And just to cross verify right here, service underscore, it looks good to me. So it must mean that it's not getting read by Vite. What we can do is we can console log it right here, this entire thing, and just check if it's getting read by our compiler. So now if I enter all the values one more time and click send, we do indeed get it. But it says service ID is invalid. So let's go to this URL. And it again leads us here. Is it possible that I copied it the wrong way? So if I go back here, and if I just enter it, oh my God, there is a comma here. Never have commas in your environment variables. As a matter of fact, you don't need strings at all. It's going to automatically take whatever is in the same line next to the equal sign. So yeah, we have that extra comma there. Now let's simply reload our terminal one more time just to be safe. And let's go back and try it one final time. And I'm gonna pass the same message. Send message. It still didn't get cleaned, which means that we must have another error. So if I go here, now it's complaining about the template ID being invalid. Okay, template ID. Let's go back here and look for our templates. Oh, it looks like it didn't get saved for some reason. So let's just do it one more time. And I'm gonna press save. Oh, no changes to save. But hey, I wanna save what we have here. Looks like this is bad design. They could have saved it immediately, but no worries. We can simply remove something from here by pressing code editor in the edit content. And we can remove the email JS team and press apply. And now press save. There we go. So template has been saved. And now we can get this new template ID, which I'm going to pass to our ENV local. There we go. Now we can go back and hopefully now it works. If I enter all of my details, make sure to reload the terminal once again, if it doesn't work. But in this case, it worked. And the email got delivered in like a millisecond. I got it immediately. So now that's great news. Our form is working and we are ready to get started with the Fox. To create our Fox, we can create a new model component right here called fox.jsx, inside of which we can run RAFCE. For the Fox, we're gonna do something similar to what we have done with the island because it's not going to be a primitive object. It's going to be a real 3D model we want to interact with. So you can go to Assets, 3D, right-click the Fox, and then click Reveal in File Explorer or Open in Finder. Once you have the model, we can go to the same website we used before. It's this one right here, where we can drag and drop your model. 
So simply drag it and drop it. This is going to give you an entire Fox model that you can move around, go to display, exports, and then copy to clipboard. Finally, you can simply override everything in the Fox and paste this new Fox object. Great. Now let's do a couple of changes. Let's immediately import scene coming from dot dot slash assets forward slash 3D forward slash fox dot GLB. Through props, we can accept the current animation as well dot 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 props, meaning spread all the other props. Then we have the actions to modify the animations, which is great. So let's make use of them. Let's say use effect where we have a callback function and it's going to change whenever the action or the current animation change. But you might be wondering, what is this current animation? Before we get to that, let's actually display the Fox. So we can go back to our contact page and then we can go below the div containing our form, which is right here. We can create a new div that's going to have a class name equal to on large devices, w-1 over 2, w-full, on large devices, h-auto, on medium devices, h, as in height, 550 pixels, and usually height is 350 pixels. So we want to modify the height of the fox so it looks good on all screen sizes. Then within this div, we can display a canvas. This canvas has to be imported from React 3 Fiber. And of course, we know that we have to have a camera. So let's say a camera. And later on, we're going to pass position as well. As a matter of fact, let's set it now to 0, 0, 5. Finally, we can display the fox right here. Don't forget the suspense. The suspense is going to allow us to load the fox nicely. So we can say suspense. That's going to have a fallback. And then within it, we can render the fox. And of course, at the top, we have to import it from the models by saying import fox from dot dot slash models forward slash fox. Once we get it in here, we can also set the fallback to loader, which we can import by saying import loader from dot dot slash components forward slash loader. Now, if we go down, we have our fox, but we can also pass some props to it, such as the position, which is going to be equal to an array of 0 0.5, 0 0.35, and 0. We can also give it a rotation equal to something like 12, 0, 0, and a scale equal to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now, if you reload the screen, everything is going to break. So let's go to inspect, and here, we can see that the Fox does not provide a default export. So we need to go back to the Fox. At the bottom, we have to remove this use GLTF and say export default Fox. And then at the top, we have to say const Fox is equal to an arrow function. Now we are truly importing it. And right here, we can provide a full path to the scene. There we go. So if we save it and reload, you can see it breaks again. Let's see why that is. If we go to the console, it's complaining about the use effect not being imported. So let's import use effect from React. Then here, I misspelled actions. And if we do it, you can see that we have some kind of a silhouette of a fox, but it's not yet looking good. Do you know why that is? Well, of course, it's because of the lights. We can also modify a couple of other things regarding the camera such as the FOV or the field of view. We can set it to 75. We can set the near to 0 0.1 and far to 1000. If we reload, everything is the same, but now we can add the lights. Let's add one directional light with an intensity of 2.5 and a position of 0, 0, 1. There we go. That's much better. Now let's rotate the fox a bit by saying minus 0.6 for the second parameter. There we go. And let's do 12.6 right here. 
There we go. So this is nicely going to position it on the screen. You can play with this a bit more, go even more precise in case you want to move it around. You can also scale it if you want to, to something like one, and you can make it one by one because this is looking a bit weird. Imagine having five here, that's not good. But if you do one, 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 it's just going to get bigger in general. I believe 0 0.5 is good. Let's focus on other lights as well. We can also give it an ambient light that's going to look like this, and we can give it an intensity equal to one. There we go. Maybe that's a bit too much. Maybe we can do 0 0.5. There we go. Now it has some shadows. And these are going to be all the lights that we need. Now, how do we trigger different animations? Well, let's go ahead and define a new animation state. So at the top, we can say use state. And we can say current animation. And it's going to be equal to idle at the start. So now we want to modify our functions called handle blur and handle focus. Once we focus, we want to set the current animation to walk. And once we exit the input, we want to bring it back to idle. So now we're switching between idle and walk. But let's also make it run once we submit the form. So we can go inside of the handle submit. In the air, we can reset the current animation to idle. So set current animation to idle, or there we had sad. Did you see that? Visual Studio Code recommended sad. And then we can also do something like run once we first handle submit. So set current animation to something like run. There we go. I believe now we should be good. So what we can do is we can pass the current animation right here into the Fox. Current animation is equal to current animation. Now, if we go into it, we are accepting it as a prop and let's actually put it to good use. Let's first figure out what the actions are by saying console.log actions. Now, if we go to our console, you can see that right here, we get an object having hit idle and walk left. So hit is going to be the running actually not run. So I have to modify my form here to say hit. And also you need to make sure that all the other ones are named the same. Now that we have those actions, we have to get the key for each one of those actions and we have to stop them. And we can do that by saying object dot values to which we pass the actions. So this is going to give us the function to call each of the actions. And we can say for each action, simply play the action dot stop. So this is going to stop all actions. But then if there is actions, and then we enter the current animation, in that case, we can call that animation and call the dot play on it. That's going to look like this actions, current animation dot play. So let's reload the page. We don't have any errors or warnings, which is great. We can go back to our contact and we can start typing. Or rather we don't, you can see already it's wigging its tail. So let's start typing and you can see how now it's walking. But if I try to send something, then it starts running. This is great. And then now we need to finally stop the run animation after some time. So to do that, we can go inside of this dot then and then create a timeout. That timeout is going to look like this set timeout where we have a callback function that's going to be called after a specific timeout. In this case, after 3000 milliseconds or three seconds. What do we want to do then? We want to set the current animation to idle and we want to clear the form. So we can put this set form right here at the top. Another thing we want to do here is we also want to trigger some kind of an alert. And for that, I'm going to teach you how to create a custom hook. Yep, you heard that right. We're going to dive into some advanced React creating a custom hook. To create it, you can create a new folder in your source folder called hooks. And then you can create a new hook or new file called usealert.js. There, you can run RAFCE. And I'm going to teach you how to create this custom hook. But why do we need a custom hook in the first place? 
Well, because you'll most likely want to use it multiple times across the project. So this is used to extract some of the project's logic. Let's get the use state coming from React. And let's define some new states by saying use state snippet, alert, and set alert. It's going to be an object where show is set to false at the start, text is set to an empty string, and type is set to danger. That kind of means that it's going to be a red one. And then we can create functions that are going to show or hide the alert by saying const show alert is equal to a function that simply calls the set alert. And then it modifies the properties. To this function, we want to pass what we need to modify. So we can destructure the values inside of an object like this by saying text and the type by default set to danger unless we pass something else. And then it's going to modify the alert to say show true. It's going to modify the text and the type of the alert. And finally, we want to have something like this for hide alert as well. So we can say hide alert. We don't need to get any of these parameters. And we can say show to false. Text is going to be set to empty string and type is going to be set to danger. Finally, hooks don't return any JSX. They return most often an object or an array to which you can pass all of these values, such as alert, show alert, and hide alert. Now we can import those utility hooks right here within our code by saying const destructure alert, show alert, and hide alert is equal to use alert, which we have to import from hooks use alert. Finally, we can use it whenever we need to alert something. In this case, that's going to happen right here after the send show success message. So we can say show alert to which we can pass show set to true text is equal to message sent successfully and type can be success. And then in the timeout, we can call the hide alert. Also, we can then again call the show alert in the catch to show the error message by saying show true. We can say the text something like, I didn't receive your message and type is going to be danger. Finally, we're going to use what we get from the alert to show it right here on top of our section or right within it by saying if alert.show is true, then we want to render the alert component and pass all of the alert properties to it. And this alert is a new component that we will create. So you can create a new component within components called alert.jsx, run RAFCE, and now we can import it in our contact section coming from components alert. For now, let's make it show always. So for now, I'm going to simply put it right here. And you can see alert at the top. So this allows us to style it. Let's give this div a class name equal to absolute top dash 10, left dash 10, right dash zero. This is just for positioning. Let's make it a flex justify dash center and items dash center as well. Within it, we can have a div that's going to give it some color. So let's say class name is equal to, it's going to be a dynamic template string where we need to look into the type. So if the type is triple equal to danger, in that case, we can return BG red 500. Else we can return BG blue 800. Now it looks like we have an error. So let's go ahead and go to inspect. And then here we can see that type is not defined. That's because we're getting the type and text from props and we need to put them here. So now if we reload and say something within this div, such as test, you can see the alert appear on top. Let's also give it a P of two for padding text dash indigo dash 100 
leading dash none, on large devices rounded dash full, flex, and the large devices inline, flex, and we can give it a role to this div is equal to alert. Finally, let's style the test within it to be a p tag that's going to render the text. We can give it a class name equal to margin right of two and text dash left. In this case, it looks like there isn't any text getting passed in. So if we go into our alert, that is true because we're now fake calling it without updating the values using our hooks, which is okay with us. Above this p tag, let's create a new p tag that's going to check the type. And if the type is triple equal to danger, then it will return failed, else it will return success. There we go. And now we can see failed. Let's also style this p tag a bit by giving it a class name equal to, it's going to be a dynamic template string once again, where we have to check for the type. So let's copy the start of this string where we check for the type. And then we can continue by giving it a flex rounded dash full uppercase padding X of two padding Y of one font dash semi bold and margin right of three. There we go. So it's going to look much better once we actually complete it. You can trust me on that. And here on top, instead of BG red 500, we can use red 800. And here we can use BG red 500 and BG blue 500 as well. Also, we want to use text stuff XS right here. So we can say text dash XS. Finally, let's give it a go with real data. So we can remove this and only show it when it needs to be shown. So let's test it one more time. We start typing the Fox start walking. We stop, it stops. We send an email and then it starts running. And after three seconds, we get a success message and it stops running exactly how it should be. But I did see that it wasn't properly aligned. So let me quickly bring back the alert we had right here. So it's going to be a typical alert that looks like this, but this time with the text element. And there we go. You can see it's not properly aligned. So this div that's inside needs to have the items dash center property as well. And now it's perfect. Great. So now we have alerts implemented as well, as well as this phenomenal Fox. And as you know, this is looking even better on a larger screen. There we go. We can look into fixing this empty space later on, but for now on larger devices, it's looking great. And this Fox really stands out once it's a bit bigger, especially when it runs, it's pretty cool to see how this is implemented. With that said, some of the coolest 3D elements of your application have been implemented and this is looking great. Later on, we're gonna fix how it moves across once you use your keyboard events, such as left and right keys. Right now, it's a bit jerky. You can see how it jumps out. We're gonna fix that. And now we can focus on the about and projects pages. These are more typical pages you need to have in every single portfolio. But here we try to keep them as professional as possible with some cool little details, such as these hover events and this amazing work experience section. So let's focus on the about section next by putting this to the side and navigating to our app and then control clicking the about section. Great work on coming this far into this build. I'm sure you're gonna love it once it's your name right here and it's deployed under your domain. To get started with our about section, we can wrap it in a section and we can give it a class name equal to max dash container. This is going to ensure that it takes the full width of the screen. Then right below, we can create an H1 and this H1 is going to say hello for now. Let's move into our about so we can see what this is about and you can see hello nicely right here. We can give it a class name equal to head dash text. After hello, you can say I am, right? So let's say hello, I'm, and then we can add a span element. This span is going to say your name, in this case, Adrian, 
and we can give it a class name equal to blue dash gradient underscore text font dash semi bold and drop dash shadow. There we go. This is looking really nice. Now below this H1, we can have a div and this div is going to render a P tag. That's going to say something like software engineer based in, you can put your country there, specializing in technical education through hands-on learning and building applications. This is my tagline. You can use anything else that you like explaining who you are as a developer and what your strong sides are. Once you enter your text there, you can give this div a class name equal to MT of five for margin top, flex, flex dash call, gap dash three, and text dash slate dash 500. There we go. Right below this div, we can have another div that's going to have a class name equal to padding Y of 10, flex, and flex dash call. Within it, we can render an H3 that's going to say my skills. Let's also give it a class name equal to sub head dash text. And if we spell it correctly, you can see that now it looks like a subhead. Right below, we want to create a div and this div is going to have a class name equal to MT of 16 to divide it a bit from the top. It's going to be a flex container and flex wrap. So the elements nicely wrap to fit the width of the content and then a gap of 12. Within here, we want to loop over our skills. The question is, where are we going to get our skills from? For that, we can use the special constants folder. If you go to your source folder, you can create a new folder called constants and within it, a new index.js file. In the GitHub just down below, you can find a modified constants.index.js file. So simply copy it and paste it right here. We have a lot of lines of code here, but it's zero logic. The only thing we have here is the content that you can update on your own. So here we mentioned some of our best projects. We also mentioned our social links as well as different experiences we've had so far. Of course, these are my experiences. What you can do is you can modify these to suit your needs. Same thing for the skills. You can see that skills is simply an array of different image URLs. And we have these images as assets, names, and types. So what you can do in case you don't know express, you can simply remove it or you can exchange it for something else. But now that we have those skills, we can just use them here by saying skills. Of course, we need to import them at the top by saying import skills coming from dot dot slash constants. And then we need to say skills dot map where we map through each individual skill. And for each skill, we want to instantly return something so we can use just the regular parenthesis right here. For each skill, we want to return a div. Within that div, we're going to render another div. And within that inner div, we can render an image. This image is going to have a source equal to skill dot image URL. It's also going to have an alt tag equal to skill dot name. And it's going to have a class name equal to w dash one over two h dash one over two and object dash contain. If we save this, you can see all of these different technologies appear, but let's make it look just a bit better by wrapping our outer div in a class name equal to block dash container. We can also give it a W of 20 and H of 20 to make it a bit larger. The inner div can have a class name equal to btn dash front rounded dash Excel flex justify dash center and items dash center as well. So now this is centered and you can see this nice animation appear above this div. Let's add one self-closing div 
that's going to have a class name equal to btn-back and rounded-xl. And this is going to give it this nice looking div. So now we have these cool technologies listed one after another. Since we're using flex wrap, you can see they nicely wrap. And in case you increase the width of the screen, they are nicely showcased right here. This is great. So now we have my skills section and we can move to the second section, which is going to be work experience. So let's go right below this entire div that talks about my skills and let's create a new div. Let's give it a class name equal to padding Y of 16. Within it, we can have an H3 that's going to say work experience and we can give it a class name equal to subhead dash text. There we go. And we can also copy this entire div that talks about our P tag here, which we can paste below the H3. So that's going to be margin top of five, flex, flex column, text slate 500, and we can nicely display it right here. But this time we're going to render some other text. We're going to say something like, I've worked with all sorts of companies leveling up my skills and teaming up with smart people. Here's the rundown. You don't have to say the same exact thing. You can say something similar, but essentially you're making the viewers anticipate the experience that's about to come. So let's go below the speed tag and below the div. And there we can create a final div that's going to have a class name equal to margin top of 12 to divide it a bit from the top and then a flex container. Within here, we want to render this phenomenal experience list, which looks good on mobile, but looks even better on desktop. And it even animates slowly. For this, we're going to use a package called React Vertical Timeline Component. You can see it right here, React Vertical Timeline Component. It has 35,000 weekly downloads. So the only thing we need to do to use it is install it by running npm install react vertical timeline component. So just type it out, react dash vertical dash timeline dash component. And then we can copy its usage. So first let's copy the imports. So at the top, we can say import vertical timeline and vertical timeline element from react vertical timeline component. And this is really important. You also need to import React Vertical Timeline Component Style Min CSS. This is going to style it to look good. From our constants, we can also import our experiences so we can map over them. And now that we imported this, let's go ahead and put it to use. What you have to do first is wrap everything in a vertical timeline that looks like this. Within it, we want to call experiences dot map, where you map over each experience. And then for each experience, you want to return a vertical timeline element. That looks like this inside of there. For now, let's render a div. And within that div, let's render an H3. That's going to render the experience dot title. If we save this and go back, you can see that we have React.js developer, React Native developer, web developer, and full stack developer. And that's because these are coming from our experiences. Once again, feel free to modify each one of these objects to work for you, where you worked and what did you do? Let's also give this H3 a class name equal to text dash black text dash XL font dash poppins and font dash semi bold. That's much better. Below the H3, let's create a P tag that's going to render experience dot company underscore name. So here we can see where did we work at. Let's give this P tag a class name equal to text dash black 500 font dash medium and font dash base. 
we also can give it a special style property equal to margin zero. This is going to fix some of the default styling coming from vertical timeline element. Below this div, we want to create a UL, an unordered list that's going to have a class name equal to margin Y of five for margin on top and bottom list dash disk margin left of five and space dash Y dash two. Inside of here, we want to show bullet point list of what did you do at that company? So here we can map over experience dot points dot map, where we get each individual point and the index corresponding to that point. And for each point, we want to return a list item that's going to render what that point says. That's going to make it look like this. Let's style the LI a bit by giving it a class name equal to text dash black dash 500 over 50, as it doesn't have to be so black, font dash normal, padding left of one, and text dash small. Let's also give it a key, since we're looping over it, equal to a template string of experience dash point dash, and then we can render the index. Now, we also need to provide a key to each one of these vertical timeline elements since we're looping over them. So let's give it a key equal to experience dot company underscore name, because they're surely going to be unique. We can also attach a date to each one equal to experience dot date, which is going to add it at the bottom. We can also add the icon, which is going to be a div, a div that's going to render an image. This image is going to have a source equal to experience dot icon, an alt tag of experience dot company name, and it's going to have a class name of w dash 60%, h dash 60%, and object dash contain. Now it looks like we have an error right here. So let's go ahead and check it out what that is by going to our console. And it looks like cannot convert a symbol value to a string. And that's happening in some kind of a span element. Interesting. So we're still getting the span element error, but it looks like it's connected to the icon. It seems like it cannot get the icon. So instead of saying icon style, this right here was supposed to be an icon. There we go. So now we can see the icon is added, but now that we have the icon, we can add the icon style equal to an object where we put a border bottom of eight pixels, a border style equal to solid, a border bottom color equal to experience dot icon BG and make sure to add a comma here and then a box shadow of none. That's going to make it look a bit better, but let's style this div to position our icon in the center of each one of these circles. So let's give it a class name equal to flex, justify dash center, items dash center, w dash full, and h dash full. And now it's looking a bit better but we're far from being done. You can see the icon is still not looking good. So I made a mistake here. This right here was supposed to be for the content. As you can see, the content is a bit bland right now, but we can say content style is this, and then it's going to add this nice background at the bottom of each one of these contents. But the icon style is going to be something different. It's going to say background is equal to experience dot icon BG. And that's going to now fill the color of each one of these logos to look good with the icon itself. And with that, our about section is completely mobile responsive and also fully functional. As you can see, not only can your viewers see what technologies and skills you're proficient in, they can hover over them, 
but also see your entire work experience. But what then? What happens once they know what you've done and they want to hire you? We want to add something known as a call to action, where they can click it and they can immediately navigate to the contact section. So let's add this CTA right here at the bottom. We can go to the last div and create something known as an HR, a horizontal line with a class name of border dash slate dash 200. This is going to create a nice line to divide what we have so far. And below it, we can create a new component. So in the components folder, create a component called cta.jsx, run RAFCE. And then within the about, you can import it right here at the bottom, CTA. And of course, import it from components, CTA. There we go. So now we can style it by turning it in a section, giving it a class name equal to CTA, adding a P tag where you can say something like have a project in mind, add a break tag then, but this break tag is only going to be visible on small devices. So if small, then it's going to be block, else it's going to be hidden. And then after that, we can say something like, let's build something together. There we go, have a project in mind, let's build something together. Let's also give it a class name equal to CTA text, which is going to make it a bit bigger. And below it, we can render a link. And this link has to be imported from React Router DOM. And it's going to have a two property pointing to forward slash contact with a class name equal to BTN. The only thing it's going to say is contact. There we go. Looking amazing on mobile devices and looking even better on the final website. If we click it, we go to our nice Fox. While we're here, let's also figure out why our background is not taking 100% of the height of the screen. We can go to inspect and then select this. And you can see that the main element is not taking the full height. So to fix it, we can close the CTA. We can close the about as well as we're done with it. And we can give our main an age of 100 VH like this. Now, if you save it, it is looking wonderful. With that said, our homepage is looking great, but the plane is not really positioned as it should be. As you can notice, if you compare it to the final version, it is a bit bigger and it is a bit farther away right here. So it looks like it's flying on the sides of the island, whereas here it looks like it's flying on top. This might look good as well, but it's up to you. We do need to make it a bit bigger though. So let's go back to our app and let's go to our home and then adjust plane screen size. Here, we can see that we're giving it a specific scale if the window is lower than 768 pixels and something else if it's larger than that. So what we can do is we're passing these screen scale and screen position for adjust plane for screen size and then we're getting the plane scale and plane position. And then we're passing them over right here, plane scale and plane position. What we need to do though, is not call them plane scale and plane position. We just need to call them scale and position because we're passing these immediately to a mesh and mesh only takes account of them if they're called exactly like that as we're spreading them right here through props. So now our plane is looking even better and it feels like we're flying over this island. I also promise we're gonna fix this left and right keys to make it look a bit less like we're moving pixel by pixel. So let's go to the island and let's go to the handle key down. Once we press a key down, we wanna also modify the rotation. So we can say rotation speed dot current and then we wanna modify it or make it equal to 0.0125. This value I found to work really good with arrow keys. And then if we press arrow right, we wanna do the same thing, 
but set it to minus 0 0.0125. Now, if we move through it, it's going to feel a bit more natural. Same thing if we move it through here, going backwards. Great. So this leaves us to do only one more thing, and that is the projects. So let's see what we have done by going here and clicking visit my portfolio. For now, this is empty, but soon enough, it's going to be filled with amazing projects to look exactly like it does right here. To start with the projects, we can copy the first part from the about as they're quite similar. So let's go to app about, and let's copy the section as well as the first div. We can paste that right here directly within the projects and we can close our section. Now, if we go back, that's going to look like this, but we want to change hello, I'm Adrian into my, and then in the span, we can say projects. There we go. That's better. Then in this P tag below, we can just say something like I've embarked on numerous projects throughout the years, but these are the ones I hold closest to my heart. Many of them are open source. So if you come across something that piques your interest, feel free to explore the code base and contribute your ideas for further enhancements. Your collaboration is highly valued. Of course, maybe this is a bit over the top. You can go with something a bit simpler. Anyway, here you can explain your projects. Then we can go below this div and create a new div. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex flex dash wrap, margin Y of 20, and the gap of 16. Here, we want to map over our projects. So right at the top, we can import projects coming from dot dot slash constants like this. Now we can say projects dot map, where we get each individual project, and we want to immediately return something. Here, make sure to use just a regular parenthesis and not a function block. For each project, we want to return a div that's going to have one more div within it. And then within that second div, we can have a self-closing div. The self-closing div is going to have a class name equal to, it's going to be dynamic of btn back rounded dash XL and project.theme. So this is going to be dynamic. Immediately below this div, we can also render another div. And this one is going to render a self-closing image. It's going to have a source equal to project.iconURL, an alt tag of project icon, and a class name of w-1 over 2, h-1 over 2, and object dash contain. Now, if we save this, you won't be able to see anything yet. But as soon as we give this outer div a class name equal to on large devices width is 400 pixels and w dash full, and we have to give it a key since we're looping over it of project dot name. Now you can start seeing the icons, but they are really white and they're not that noticeable. So this inner div can have a class name equal to block dash container and W of 12 and the height of 12. This is going to make them much smaller so they can fit nicely. Then this div containing the image has to have a class name equal to BTN front rounded dash XL flex justify dash center items dash center. And there we go. Now we have these wonderful looking icons that when you hover over them, they look great. Right below these two divs, we can create another div to provide more info about each project. Specifically, we can give it a class name equal to margin top of five flex and flex dash call. Immediately within, we can render an H4 that's going to render the project dot name. Below the H4, we can render a P tag that's going to render the project dot description. 
And below the P tag, we're going to have a div inside of which we can render a link. This link has to be imported from React Router DOM. It's going to point to project dot link. It's going to open in a new tab by giving it a target of underscore blank. And if we're doing that, we also have to give it a rel of no opener, no refer. We can also give it a class name of font dash semi bold and text dash blue dash 600. Within the link, we can say just that live link. So this is going to point to our deployed website. Below the link, we can also render an image that's going to have a source equal to arrow. And we have to import it from assets icons, an alt tag of arrow, as well as a class name of w-4, h-4, and object-contain. So now it's looking like this. Let's style those projects just a bit by styling this h4. We can give it a class name of text-2xl to make the title much bigger as it's important, font-poppins, and font-semi-bold. The p tag can have a class name equal to margin top of two and text dash slate dash 500. And then a div containing the link can have a class name of mt5 to divide it a bit from the top, flex, items dash center, gap of two, and font dash poppins as well. Now, this is looking wonderful on mobile devices, but at the bottom, Going all the way down below this last div, we want to create an HR, a horizontal line, with a class name of border dash slate dash 200. And below it, I think you already know it, we can put a call to action, which we can import from components CTA. So now if somebody sees your about section, they can contact you. Or if they check out your project, they can contact you so you can do theirs. And with that said, believe it or not, this is it for the project section. So we can close it as well as the app and we can expand the website. Here, it looks like we still have some issues. It looks like it's not going all the way down right here. So one fix for that is to go to our app and then within the app, give it the height of full. So H dash full. Now it's going to take the full height and it's going to work well with the about section, but for contact, it still breaks. So we can go to contact and simply give our outer section an H dash 100 VH. And now this is going to fill the entire screen. So once again, the home is now looking wonderful. We can scroll through with the plane. Then we can visit the about section. This is looking great as well. We have the contact section, and now we have this new project section where you can hover over it. You can see different projects that you have done. Of course, please modify these projects. The way you can do that is by going to our constants. And then here you can modify not only your experiences or social links, but also the projects. For example, you can modify the icons, the themes, the names, and even the descriptions and links of the apps you built. How cool is that? This is a comprehensive portfolio and it is completely yours. I want you to modify it, deploy it, and then even tag me on LinkedIn with a link to your own custom domain of the deployed portfolio. It's not every day that you build something so amazing. And now is your perfect time to showcase it before thousands of other people do so. This is completely new. It's something that has never been seen before. So the last thing we have to do before we deploy it is just add one little extra touch. And that is to add some sound to the application as well. Once you click it, we can play some sound to let the user fully immerse into our 3D world. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's go to our home and let's start implementing audio. To implement our sound, we first have to have some audio. 
So let's import Sakura, which is the name of this audio I decided to use from dot dot slash assets forward slash Sakura dot MP3. Feel free to use any MP3 file right here. The only thing you have to do is just download it, put it within the assets, and then put it right here and then refer to it right here. Once you have it, you can import use effect as well as use ref coming from React. Then we can initialize this new audio ref. Const audio ref is equal to use ref at the start equal to new audio. And then you can pass the audio of your choice. We can immediately modify the volume by saying audio ref dot current dot volume is equal to 0 0.4. We don't want to make it too loud. And also we want to set audio ref dot current dot loop is set to true because we want it to loop. Next, we want to create a new use state field called is playing music set is playing music at the start set to false. Then we can also create a use effect. This use effect is going to run whenever this new state changes. So we can add the is playing music as the only element of the dependency array. And then if is playing music is true, we can simply call the audio ref dot current dot play. And otherwise we can return and then call the audio ref dot current dot pause. Now the question is, how are we going to trigger it on and off? And the answer is pretty simple. We're going to create a simple button to do that for us. So going all the way down, we can go to our current website and then go below the canvas, create a new div that's going to contain an image with a source equal to sound on like this which we need to import from assets icons. This div can have a class name equal to absolute bottom two and left two. And now we can see this huge icon. But if it's not currently playing music, then we want to show sound off. Else we want to show sound on and make sure to also import sound off. There we go. We can give it an alt tag of something like sound. We can give it a class name of W of 10, H of 10, and cursor dash pointer, as well as object dash contain. Now you can see this little button. But finally, let's add an on click that's going to trigger the callback function, which is going to call the set is playing music, and it's going to toggle this state on or off. So right now you can see how it changes on or off. And even though you cannot hear it in the recording as I'm wearing headphones right now, I can see some nice music playing into my ears. So I fully feel immersed into this world. You can choose your own type of music to match this island and make it work. But with that said, that was it when it came to implementing the music. And with that, also finalizing our entire application. And if you click the button, you'll be able to hear the music. There we go. I hope you can hear it. I can hear it on my headphones. It sounds great. And I truly feel immersed into this world. Now, yes, it will stop if you go to some other page, but that's totally okay. We only want to have it once we are on our homepage and when the bird is flying, the birds are chirping and we have a plane flying over it. If we move, that's okay. Here we want to focus on what matters, which are your other projects. But with that said, I'm going to let the music keep playing. I'm going to expand it to its full glory. And hey, with that said, your full project is now complete. This is amazing. You can go over the island. You can visit your portfolio reach the contact section or do anything else. The app is fully mobile compatible and it works well. And just so you can hear me well, I muted the music for now. 
because we are preparing for one of the most important parts of this application, besides developing it, of course, and that is deployment. Before we deploy it, notice how we have to change the title and the favicon of our application to say your full name and then portfolio. To do that, you can close our home and then you can go to the index.html and here you can modify the title to say something like your first or your full name and then something like portfolio. Finally, you can modify this link to point to forward slash source forward slash assets forward slash favicon dot ICO. This is going to modify it to be this nice looking island on top left. Great. Finally, we are ready for deployment. Or you can also say we are ready for takeoff. So let's go ahead and deploy our phenomenal applications on Hostinger's fast servers with a custom domain name. And we are back on the setup for our 3D portfolio hosting. Once you're here, go to the file manager, enter the public HTML, and then remove the default PHP. This is where our build folder will go. So let's go back to our application, close all of the files, and then open the terminal by going right here, view, and then terminal. We can close the second terminal, and we can stop the application from running by pressing Control C. Now we can run npm run build. This is going to create an optimized version of our application ready for production. This process usually takes just about a minute, so let's leave it be, and I'll be right back. Actually, it took about 10 seconds right now. So let's go to our file explorer, and you'll be able to see a new dist folder appear. Right-click it, and then click Revealing File Explorer or Open in Finder. Once you have it, open it up, and then simply drag and drop all the files into our Hostinger's H panel. This is going to upload them one by one, it's going to take a moment and that's it. You can now close your H panel, go back to your hosting and click on the domain name. In a matter of seconds, you'll see your portfolio load on your new domain. And as you can see, our connection is secure, which means that we're using HTTPS security. You can scroll through it as you usually would on your local host, but now you can share this custom link with everyone. You can also click learn more to go to different pages and notice that everything is working exactly as expected. Your portfolio is now online and you can share it with everyone in the world. Having a performant, fast, optimized and HTTP certified domain name definitely makes you stand out from the crowd. This way your page is reliable and secure. So now that you have your portfolio, share it with your friends and employers but I want to give you an extra task, and that is to go to LinkedIn, establish your profile, and share what you've done with the world. Also, make sure to tag JavaScript Mastery. Many people already are creating their portfolios and projects and tagging us. We always like to reshare everything our community has done. So make some changes, improvements to the project you've seen, and then tag us on LinkedIn. I'll surely check it out and leave a comment. On top of that, if you came to the end of this video, it means you truly are a perfect fit for our ultimate Next.js 14 course. Right now, it's one of the only Next.js 14 courses in the world, and it's going to make you a top one Next.js developer. Make sure to use these Black Friday discounts and level up your developer career. So with that said, once again, huge congratulations on coming to the end of this video. You are an amazing developer, and this is just the beginning. Thank you so much for watching, and have a wonderful day.